good afternoon. Welcome back. Um, I'm Keenan, the director of the speaker team. It's my honor to welcome you to our next panel discussion on the socioeconomic implications of free trade agreements. Um, with us today, we have Dr. Hyunbang Jin, who's an associate professor of geography and urban studies at the LSC, and who will be chairing the session. And we'll introduce you to our amazing speaker. Hope you all enjoy, and thank you. Right. Good afternoon. I hope you enjoyed the uh, lunch here uh, um, upstairs, and um, and it's quite nice actually to have this session today um, um, on the imp imp uh, implications of the free trade agreement on social and the uh, uh, social side of the stories. Uh, we often get to hear, and I'm sure you have heard a lot about the economic side of the story, especially the, the uh, issues concerning the geopolitical economy and also bilateral uh, uh, interactions between economies and so on. Uh, we op while we often hear about the, uh, the economic and financial side, we don't rarely, uh, or well, we not rarely, but we get, we get to hear much less about the social side of the stories uh, or the cultural side of the stories. And these are two issues, culture and uh, 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 social aspects of free trade agreement will be the topic for the first session today. And we have the, uh, the great pleasure of having uh, four uh, esteemed speakers, uh, two of, uh, and two speakers uh, uh, who are going to kick off with discussions on the cultural side of the stories of EU-Korea free trade agreement. And the second two speakers will be talking about the labor rights from the perspective of uh, trade unions. So what we'll do today um, is, in this session, we are dividing this afternoon, the first afternoon, afternoon session into two. So we'll start with the uh, discussions on the cultural aspect. Uh, um, and the, each speaker will uh, give a talk for about 10 minutes. And we'll also uh, have Q&As right after the first two speak, uh, 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 talks uh, before moving on to the second part of the session today. So what I'll do is, without further ado, is uh, to introduce our uh, guest speakers. The order of these uh, talks will be uh, in this following order. So uh, Dr. Jimin Park, uh, who is a visiting lecturer at Social Science Sciences Po in Paris, uh, and an associate, associate researcher at the EU, EU Center Graduate School of International Studies at Seoul National University. Uh, Dr. Uh, Park has been uh, publishing several academic articles and uh, ha uh, having conducted a number of research projects related to competitiveness of organizations, industries, and countries. The second speaker, uh, who is on my right, is Professor uh, Patrick Misselin, who is chairman of European Center for International Political Economy. Uh, Economy and uh, European Center for International Political Economy's steering committee uh, and also advisory board uh, in the center. He is also Professor Emeritus of Economics at Sciences Po Paris. And more recently, between 2009 and 2012, he was a member of the World Economic Forum's Global Trade Council, which he chaired in 2010 and 2011. And during all these years, he has been a consultant to many international organizations, governments, and firms. So without further ado, uh, le let us welcome Dr. Park for the first set. <laughs> The problem is like, uh, you know, when it comes to film industry, you can see that lots of people, they just argue that actors, film productors um, helped the success of the Korean film industry. Um, well, the problem is actually what well, they focus on, you know, what happened in uh, 2006. Uh, well, at the time, we had, um, Korea had um, US FTA, uh, US Korea FTA. So, you know, people believe that actually it is something. So they only talk about the screen quality, about that actually if you know what happened before, it gives a totally different interpretation. Also, while well, many of them, they don't have any, you know, really, really good data set to argue about, I mean, or to support what they are talking about. So that's a little bit problem. Also, well, many of them, they just misunderstand the real, you know, important factor, which is actually cooperation. 
resource area while I don't focus on objective. Okay, this is just brief history of film, film industry, and uh, you can see that there are very important three measures. The first one is the input quota, second one is skin quota, and the third, the success rate. Um, well, this is the um, uh, market share and then the number of admission of Korean film industry. As you see here, it's very interesting from the 1965, but well at the time, Korean film industry had actually golden age, that's what we call it. And then all of a sudden, it was kind of decreasing. And then in 1970s, 80s, and till 90s, you know, it was like huge stagnancy. And then all of a sudden, 2000, you know, the in the late uh, 90s, 1990s, you can see that there's a boom of uh, Korean film industries. Uh, today, I'll just talk about the input quota and skin quota. And the input quota all, uh, it existed before, and then it was abolished in 1985 and six, because at the time Korea had a film in, uh, industry agreement with the United States. And then they asked us, you have to abolish the input quota if you want to export more cars to the United States. So actually, lots of people believe that what we were prepared to open up the market, but actually it was given to us. But people, they don't talk about that that far. Another one is the skin quota, and then there is a 2006. Um, before actually the US, um, Korea, um, FDA discussed and on since uh, early 2000s. And then well, all of a sudden we uh, just decided to lower the uh, skin quota days. Before it was 136 days, and later <laughs> it is uh, 73 days, and uh, still it is 73 days. Okay, first, input to quota means basically, you know, you control the number of foreign films imported to Korea. Uh, what government did is actually if to the Korean film industry, I mean, Korean production, they input three films, they can get one license to import one foreign film. It was very important because the Korean companies import successful foreign film in order to maximize their profits. So, as you see over there, the first graph on the top uh, right side, you can see that, you know, what the input, no, the number of the ratio of imported uh, foreign films, it is pretty much, you know, half. However, they cannot control the number of uh, the admissions to uh, foreign films. So actually, so a lot of people, they just went there, I mean, moved here to watch foreign films. The bottom, it is um, admission per film. So as you see here, per film, there's a lot of people who went there to watch foreign films. Then it just all of a sudden dropped right after the abolishment of uh, input quota. On the other hand, you can see here Korean film industry, and uh, well, first kind of modest, but after the, um, uh, starting from the early uh, 1990s, you can see there's a boom of Korean film industry. What happened is uh, very interesting. Um, uh, the um, one thing, in order to maximize the profits, what Korean companies did is actually they import successful foreign films, which is already approved. So when they bring the kind of film, it is really successful in Korea, so they have tendency to bring a lot of films, uh, good films. But actually in Korea, domestic market, the story is pretty different. It is kind of unfair competition because average Korean film had to compete against very well-made foreign films. That's very strange. Also, as I told you before, you know, the government can control the number of foreign films imported, but they cannot control the number of admission. That is for foreign films. Uh, one thing, because when the Korean productions, when they produce three films, they can get one license to import one foreign film, which is very uh, profitable. What they did is they just produce a bunch of quota cookies, which means like a, actually just to make, uh, to import foreign films, they produce you know, lots of films. That happened. But in the end, they actually didn't help the Korean film industry at all. Um, cooperation systems, it is just facility, I mean, they just enhance everything in order to import foreign film. So basically, they didn't invest a lot of money to make good, to make good domestic films, but it is more like, you know, how to import better films from outside of Korea. But after we abolished the uh, import quota, the system is so different. First, because Hollywood film, in, uh, the studios, they can uh, di distribute directly in Korea, and it changes everything. The companies, Korean companies, cannot import good foreign films. That means that they cannot make an, any profits. In order to have bargain power against the American big film studios, what they did is actually they bought small uh, movie theaters. 
And then it is the first point of what we call explaining CMS chains, like CVV and Megabucks. So it started over time. So they could have bargain power against American uh, big studios so they can lower the price when they import. Another one is like, uh, because uh, there's a lot of, you know, the Hollywood films, they come to Korea and then they believe that whenever they just release foreign films, it can be really, really, you know, profitable. But actually a lot of peop uh, films came to Korea and the people realize that Amer uh, American, especially Hollywood films, it's not really, really good. There are some good, some are not, not really good. So they just realize that it is just like a chain selling. Oh, another one is foreign investment. Uh, Korean companies actually, they knew that the foreign films are very profitable. So what they did is like they have already a film, the movie theater, they have a chain. So they believe that if they invest in Hollywood and bring back that film and show in their movie uh, theater, they can make a lot of money. So they invest a lot. But movie industry is kind of hard to predict, you know, if it can be successful or not. So most of them, they are fear. Plus, Hollywood you know, films, they actually use a lot of budget. And at the time, for, for Korean companies in 1980s and 90s, it's pretty small. So, you know, the investment for them is huge. But for Hollywood film studios, it is not. So they failed a lot. Then they believe that, oh, okay, why not we bring those, you know, investment back to Korea to invest in Korean film industry. So, uh, in 1992, actually Korean companies, they produced the first uh, film. That's what we call planned film. So basically the Korean companies went to Hollywood and they learned the Hollywood virtualization system, which means like basically you decide scenario, actor, actresses, director, distribution channel, and everything. So that is the, uh, what we, uh, the title in Korea that they released in 1992, that's uh, Wedding Story, and it had grand success. And then right after that, lots of Korean companies, they just fly out their way to produce Korean film industry. Another one, uh, well, because of you know, the movie, uh, the everything just changed. So they said like, the only thing they have to do, they just produce really, really good films in order to uh, make a lot, lots of profits. And then at this time, they started to invest a lot of money and then to produce a bunch of, you know, blockbuster. Sounds like, uh, like uh, Shiri and JSA and Friends. So this is the second point. The second one is about the screen quota system. And then, let me stop this one. Okay, screen quota system is basically you guarantee several days only for domestic film industry. So it is basically by day, the number of days. So basically it was 146 days and then it became 73 days. As you see here, actually the screen quota system is really, really tightened. The whole Korean industry just, you know, fall down. So it doesn't the admission. Lots of people argue that actually 2006, when we cut the screen quota, and then it affected a lot of things. But actually, if you know what's going on here, it's two different stories. Lots of people believe that, you know, the number of film produced is very important. So we calculated everything, and also the admission number. So we hit the, the data of 2000 as 100, then we just, you know, uh, observe the changes. Um, in terms of the film number produced or imported, it's, it is just like a, you know, usual business. So there means like basically no change. However, actually you can see that there's lots of people, they didn't go to movie theater to see Korean films, but there's a little bit increase of, uh, increase for foreign films. That means like a case of people, they went there uh, to see uh, foreign films, but the decrease is not just like increase. So there's uh, some strange gap. What happened here is actually it's very interesting. Um, they can control the number of sessions. Basically, they count the days. So they show Korean films once a day, but they show like a foreign films like a six times a day. So, you know, there's a still some kind of, you know, problem. And also they can control the number of foreign films over sessions, but they cannot control the admission. Another one, what well in 1990s, Korean companies started to tr uh, construct multi cinema, which means like a basic there's a big movie theater, which has a lot of seats. And then there's a small, which has a lot, which doesn't have a lot of seats. So, you know, they just play with that kind of thing. And then another one is blockbuster. You know, they invest a lot of money. Then all of a sudden they say like, okay, the government will start negotiation with the United States. So for them, the business environment is not really clear. So what they did is actually, they didn't invest a lot of money to produce Korean films. So the number of film produced in Korea 
It's almost the same, but the budget for film is lower, increased a lot. Uh, after the screen got cut, it changed about everything. Uh, well, right now people, they argue that in Korea, well, we just show one Korean film. For example, like the last year, Dale Sun, you know, everywhere you, did, uh, you go to movie theater, you can see Myung Myung Hae Sun. So people complain about it. But actually, it is related to quota system. Because it doesn't matter how many films you have sold, but you pick up just one domestic film, and then you select the 72 days. It doesn't matter. That's why, you know, last you know, to increase the, you know, the uh, profits, that's why they, they show just one Korean film everywhere. Another one. Uh, in order to attract more people, they just commercialize the films. Lots of people argue that Korean films are too commercialized, but actually, when it comes to foreigners, it's totally different. For Koreans, it may be not really Korean, but for foreigners, they can still, there is some Korean thing. So still, it is related to culture a lot. Multiplex, because we have a lot of multiplex, so what we did is that basically we have to fill out the, you know, the programs. So they did, what they did is that they just imported a lot of different genres of films. Also, before it was mostly United, I mean American films, but later it can turn into European and other countries' films. So it's you know, become really diverse. The blockbuster, after we did, uh, the Korean companies didn't invest a lot of money. Actually, the directors, they learned how to produce the movie really, really efficiently. So even though with a low budget, they can produce really, really quality films. Okay, the conclusion, well, most important thing that is pro-competition measures to produce trade. So actually, it helps the Korean film industry. Lots of people believe that it is very good for the film industry, but actually, no, it's not. The second one, people argue the success, uh, commercial success is not really good for culture, but that is, um, they don't know about the term, uh, perception lagging. For Koreans, it's not really Korean, but for foreigners, it is Korea, so still, it is good. Uh, third, lots of people believe that, you know, cultural exception, especially France and Canada, they just highlighted this one, you know, and then this is actually hindering the, um, the cultural goods, the trade of cultural goods, but actually the real cultural diversity should be related to cultural ex excellence. Basically, you should enhance your competitiveness, otherwise you cannot really enjoy cultural diversity. This is my presentation, and thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, very much for the very exciting talk about the, the current status or the historical development of the cultural industry, especially in the areas of film production. Uh, I believe we are now going to have a more European side of the uh, uh, view, uh, side of the story uh, on the uh, similar issue. So without further ado, Professor Mesolin, please. Uh, you know, we started with Korea because first of all, we know many of you are from Korea, but I think they don't, you don't know the history of the Korean business. And I think it's very important to have seen all the complexity, the dynamic of the uh, cultural industry, the cinema industry in Korea, because we have a huge success in the world. And of course, this success raised big question for the Europeans. So, and I would like to start with from three points. The first one, and relate that to the free trade agreement. Uh, Jimin mentioned exactly what the U.S. was doing twice uh, to Korea in 86 and in the EU Korea, U.S. Korea uh, negotiation. You have to liberalize your market. And what the Koreans have done, very clever, they have liberalized the market in which the end policy did not work. Import quota did not work. Everybody was knowing that in 86. The security quota did not work. Most of the people did not recognize that, but some people recognize that. So they have been very clever negotiator. In fact, selling something which did not work for getting access in car market in the US. And that's something to remember, that sometimes that a partner in the trade agreement which force you to make a reform uh, is a welcome help uh, to do and to go further. And in fact, the US have believed have been excellent negotiator, not at all, but they have helped the Korean government to uh, remove the uh, bad uh, storage uh, import quota clause in the uh, Korean trade. Now, for the Korea EU, it's different. We don't have really an agreement. It, I mean, the, the, res the provision on the film industry and the cultural industry are very minor in the EU uh, Korea free trade agreement. But then at least you could use what is going on in the partner in order to assess what is going on at home. So in some sense, the second function of a XTA is to help every country 
to assess its own regulations, looking at the regulations of the other, and especially at the regulation of the best partner. And uh, Korea has an excellent success in this lean industry, so it's good for the French, and I'm using French, not only French, this is also for the French to think about why Korea is going very fast, very high, why we are stuck, what is going on in, Fr in Paris since Seoul is, uh, is coming. The third point, uh, I think Korea gives, and it's not only in cinema, it's also in music, K-pop, and, and we have, both of us, we have papers and economic analysis of K-pop and all the cultural industries. It shows that you can be a remote country. Remember what uh, Professor Bach told you at the beginning in the 70s and the 80s, they are the hopeless country, the UN, uh, the UN assessment of Korea in the 50s. And you look, you are, you are the first Asia country which has shifted from an economic engine to a cultural engine. And that's, of course, it shows that everybody can do it if we have the right policies, the right business, the right environment, and some modesty. So that's what we give when we have to do it. And last and not least, and that's, of course, for the Koreans, I think it's something we understand very well, Cultural industry is not opposed to culture. Cultural industries can be a gate, a door, a bridge to the culture. Many people, including me, have been, I mean, I've been in Korea many times before, but I feel that I have some more deeper connection with Korea when I was looking at the film, at the, at the K-pop, and I said, oh, that's really something new, some energy at last uh, compared to what is going on in Paris. So that's very quick. Now I have only three, four minutes to finish on the French audiovisual industry, which is very easy, and I'll go quickly because it's, it's killing myself, but it's a disaster. It's just a plain disaster. <laughs> and, you know, the fact that Korea is going very well forced us to say, it is a to say in Paris, it is a disaster, and there are other recipes, but the recipe we have lost. Basically, here you have an idea about the disaster, and the first idea. This is the value added, so most of you here are not economists, but this is the, wor the value created by the cinema industry in France and the broadcasting industry in France. Basically today, the Korean cinema industry and the Korean broadcasting industry have the same size as the, the French industry. So in, in less than 15, 20 years, you, are pass you, are, you have gone from bottom to the level of the French, which is not a tremendous achievement, you know, and you have catch up. Now, what we have in column three, we have this value added with a lot, column three, sorry, with a lot of subsidies. We give subsidies and subsidies. It costs us every year 700 million of euros in the cinema and 5 billion of euros in the, in the broadcasting system. So when you look at the column three, and we don't have time to look at the other, uh, you have the very high rate of protection, uh, the subsidy rate, Basically, the subsidies represent 25% of what is, what is done by the cinema. So it means when you have four euros done by the cinema, one is coming directly from the pocket of the French program. So it's just a black hole. The cinema industry has not done anything. And when you look even worse, when you look at the broadcasting, basically, they have done nothing. The subsidy rate is 100%. And you know, that's not you could think that's a crazy professor. Uh, no, that figures are done by the Inspection Générale des Finances, the highest body of the Ministry of the Finance in France. So it's really the assessment of a disaster. And just a little bit more, you could say, oh, well, okay, we give a lot of subsidies, but there is the French interest, the French cinema, and that's very well known. Well, let's look, so you have looked at the cost, but let's look at the benefit. So maybe because of all the subsidies, everybody is knowing uh, the French culture. And I have spent enough time in Seoul, and most of you know Seoul very well, that the last, uh, the only music that you hear in Seoul is Edith Piaf from Regrette Rien, 1953. <laughs> That's the last sign that there is some brain in Paris. Uh, so in some sense, the influence today, what it is, how big it is. And I'm not cruel enough to look at, and it's in fact, it's too difficult, statistically speaking, but I'm looking at the influence of the French cinema on the French audience. Uh, so, so let's start by ourselves. And then you have here four curves. The three but of top curves, they are basically, they are very ways to, to measure the rate of subsidy, the, the level of subsidy. 
and he can teach a huge amount of subsidies during the last 10 years. Right? So there's a case from 100 who are between 150 and 200 in terms of income. Huge amount of subsidies. And the dotted line, this is the uh, French audience, the French worker in the French cinema class, right? complete class. You have five blockbusters during 10 years. And only one of these five blockbusters will be remain outside France, which is all anti, anti chat and anti federal state. Not very interesting. So, in terms of influence, we have put a lot of money from Africa. Now, of course, it's even more dramatic in broadcasting. So, the three top curve is the rate in subsidies and subsidies, and uh, the dotted line is the the number of French make made movies and documentaries in the French broadcast, and it's going down. And in fact, this figure going down from 100 to 90, it's an overestimate of the reality because it's based on what is watched by the French people in the um, in the French TV. But you know, in my own TV, I think I have 300 channels. I never look at the French channel. So when they look at the French channel, they just ignore my program <laughs> because I look at all the other channels. And of course, I am an old guy, and the young guy has much closer to me <laughs> than, to <laughs> than anybody else. So this figure is really an overestimate of the situation. So you can understand uh, what is uh, the disaster. And so we need to do something. And you in some sense, the current example is a waking, uh, waking up signal, but it's also a cheerful signal. If the South Korean has succeeded, we are not less clever than you. It's probably we have made mistake. So let's try to get a, a couple of this is the conclusion remark. First, is such a failure a surprise? No. And I insist very much because that's the beginning of my revenge. The advice, the lessons to Korea. Right? So far, you heard many lessons from Korea to France, but now I'm shifting lessons from France to Korea. Uh, subsidies. The way you give subsidies to movie makers is a stupid way. You create rent-seeking person, you create grants, uh, you create networking in order to get the subsidies. Right? So you are really using a bad instrument. Screen quota was a bad instrument, import quota was a bad instrument, subsidies, specific subsidies is a bad instrument. Second, economics. Some of you know we are in the, you are in the country of the lords, and the lords have large land, and they are very rich because of the common agricultural policy. So in some sense, the film industry is the same. You give subsidies to the film industry, to the culture, quote unquote, to get the subsidies, to get the subsidies which is this, the uh, main actor, the top actor. And in fact, all this stuff has been triggered two or three years ago when one movie maker said the French actors are earning too much. A French guy, talking to a French fellow in Le Monde and Eve of Christmas, <laughs> not close to Christmas Eve. Now, so now, so you can see, you, you don't give that to culture, you give that to uh, Depardieu or to other things, but not to the French culture. Two ways lesson. I insist a lot on Korea to the EU. Be careful, make right policy. Uh, give essentially, as Jimmy say, room to do business and uh, Embrace technological opportunities. That's very important to me. It's very hard to do that. But the reality is they have run, at least for everybody, is not enough. Now, EU to Korea. Jimin did not talk very much about PPP. But unfortunately, Korea is now taking the French crown. They, they say, ah, you, you, have, you have been interpreted by us. <laughs> so they think, well, we have to promote Korean cinema industry by giving subsidies to Korea, to the Korean producer. That has been transfer fuel at the end of the screen quota because there was fear that the shift will be too bad. But now it has been, how do you say, uh, and four, four, four or five years. Uh, it could become a permanent feature. And if it will become a permanent feature, Kai is telling you, you are going nowhere. Come from the disappearance, progressive disappearance of the film industry and the way you are current film industry is already on imperialized and subsidies. It's a too bad instrument. Thank you. This is my direct answer. Thank you very much. Well, 
thank you so much uh, uh, to two speakers uh, just now. Uh, we do have uh, some minutes um, for Q and A's. I think we might have about just about enough time for about three questions. So why don't you collect all three uh, and let the speakers respond? So yes, we have one here in the middle on the first floor. We're on the ground floor, sorry. Uh, okay, there's one there on the uh, bar in the balcony area. Please do state your name and where you, uh, and your institution or your background. Hello, I'm Rachel from the University of Hong Kong. Thank you very much for your interesting insight to the Korean uh, film industry. I have a question to Mr. Park. You mentioned that relaxing screen quarter boosted competition. However, I personally doubt that this is a, there is a strict competition regulation in place in the movie industry in Korea. As you briefly mentioned, Korean movie supply channels are dominated by Korean conglomerates, Lotte, CJ, McBoss, um, and their child companies. In that environment, movies di directed by small and medium-sized um, companies are often left vulnerable in a competition against large-scale Hollywood movies and also large-scale um, Korean films that were directed and supplied by Korean conglomerates. In that aspect, I think it conversely restricts choices of consumers. What, what's your view on this? Okay, uh, one up, yes, on the um, uh, uh. Um, I'm Jackie Yoon, studying MSc Finance and Econ in LSE. Um, I want to ask questions to Mr. Park and also to uh, Pratik. Mr. Patrick, um, so my, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry, sorry, anyways. <laughs> okay, please, uh, right. let us hear uh, your question. My first question is to Mr. Park. Actually, I have um, some friends um, put who is a producer in the film industry. Um, he told me that, like, uh, after, after the screen quarter was, cut it. Um, it became less and less profitable to stay in the film industry. So he decided to uh, just go to advertisement industry. Because, and everyone is doing that because it's like the profit is going low and low and low. And actually um, I, heard, um, I heard from my friends that uh, the big companies, you know, like y as you said, during the screen quarter, CGV or like the big big companies, they domin dom how to say dominate everything. So, um, what do you think about that? And like, do you, do you, do you have some solutions or like, good you know, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and my <laughs> okay, uh, my um, my question to Patrick, <laughs> Mr. Patrick, is like um, as a European. You told a lot of good things about Korea, but like, what do you think about like the traditional culture? Um, do you think it has like culture, cultural power? Like, um, for example, Taichung or um, the the film Kwanghe or like Myeongyang Hejeon. Do you think it's attractive um, to Europe countries like to push those kind of cultural powers, or do you think that? Um, Korean films should be more diversified or like more like as a European style, global, global style, or yeah, that's my okay, question. I think that's probably enough for, for now. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm aware of the time, remaining time, so I, I might have to restrict the responses yes. to about five minutes at the most. Uh, the question basically about the, well, essentially the implication for small and medium-sized uh, uh, companies which are dominant uh, which are overpowered by conglomerate and also the second uh, I think both two questions are interrelated in this way the th third question to Patrick regarding how traditional culture based Korean films are uh, whether they are attractive to French audience okay um, as I mentioned before you know the mega box and uh, CGV and those kind of being not there okay one thing you have to know is that why these small companies, they were small actually before, okay? How come these small companies became big companies? That's the most important you know, implication that you, think, you have to think about it. The second one, yes, uh, the problem is SME, 
again. But there are two kinds of different SMEs, okay? The first one is actually you compete against the real ones, the big ones, okay? In this case, well, people talk about this one, it's a big problem. But you have to think of also, you have to think about the trade also, okay? There's a lot of bigger, you know, you know, conglomerates, foreigners, like, uh, you know, Time Warner and Disney, and even now, you know, in China, also Shanghai Media Group, they just, you know, take over the Dongbang, uh, Dongbang Minju, something like that. So, you know, basically it's a competition between big companies in the world market, global market. So it's very different. Another one, there are another kind of SME, which actually they, uh, they have some subcontract with big companies, and then they have collaboration or cooperation with big companies. In this case, it's a totally different story. Well, in Korea, lots of small companies, they said, well, okay, big companies actually, they push us to lower the cost. But if you know what's going on in Germany, it is very interesting, okay? There are so many small and medium-sized companies, but actually their export, more than half, is outside of Germany. Basically, they have technology, they have competitiveness, that's why they have deal with other bigger companies. So they play with bigger companies, okay? So that means like, you should enhance your competitiveness first. Well, otherwise you can just, you know, the whole film industry can be, you know, perished. There's no choice. Uh, can I uh, ask uh, speakers to respond to all these uh, three questions? Uh, Patrick. Quickly on SMEs. Uh, of course, in cinema, SMEs, uh, you have a high cost in, in cinemas, much higher cost than in music. So in music, in K-pop, you have three small firms, very small firms, SM Entertainment, 1,000 staff. And they are doing a huge business and threatening, in fact, the majors, the Western majors. Uh, in cinema, it's more complicated because you have fixed costs. But remember today, because of the electronic aspect, the, the fixed costs have decreased by 90%. And you have stuff which has been, in fact, created in Korea, crowdfunding, all this stuff, in order to, to generate funds for very independent movie. And you have the same thing in the US and the Korea. So it's very really complicated. And as Jimmy say, they were small at the beginning, they are big today, and they, maybe they will perish later. Now, on f culture, f cultural film versus culture, depends about every film. There is no general, re general uh, reason about that. I think that when I see Korean film, there is something which I feel different from a US movie, Hollywood movie, or French movie. An energy, something like that. Sometimes very brutal. Uh, you wake up. Uh, and the same thing in the K-pop. And again, if you can stop at the film, you can stop at the dance of the K-pop group. But then many times you say, oh, I would like to know a little bit more about the country which has produced this kind of stuff. And then you look at the history, you look at the people, and the not at the kimchi, because you cannot cannot eat kimchi, which is terrible, but uh, you can really uh, go really deeper and deeper. I stop here because yes. I think, right. I I think uh, because of the given yeah, remaining yeah. time, and we would like to also ensure the remaining two speakers have yeah. their own uh, sure. uh, time to express their views. So can I welcome everyone to thank our two speakers. <laughs> And now we move on to the second set of the first panel, uh, welcoming Mr. Tom Jenkins and Mr. Yogos Atentis. Uh, right. Uh, well, if anyone has any you know, quest remaining questions regarding the first uh, two pan uh, speakers in the talks and also in you know, the uh, second uh, uh, two uh, speakers, uh, do use the reception, the, the, uh, the refreshment time you know, to grab these speakers and just you know, fire away your questions as, as many as you want. Um, well, even before moving into uh, the second session, for a second part of the first session, uh, it'll be useful to actually, I've got some kind of, kind of figures which might uh, probably uh, be a useful reference point for an you know, audience here uh, before we move into the labor right issues. Uh, especially regarding South Korea, uh, according to some of the data, South Korea is quite notorious for very long average working hours, especially among the OECD countries, South Korea is scoring 
2,285 hours of working hours per year for average uh, uh, South Korean workers. That's about, uh, well, that's about, uh, uh, about 40, about 30 percent more than the OECD average. And compared to German workers, South Korean workers are actually working more than uh, four months more each year. Uh, South Korea is also in among the OECD countries has very uh, high share of temporary workers, according to OECD data, uh, which are still nevertheless some critics uh, complain that it underestimates the size. But, uh, but still, the official data from OECD says 22.4% uh, of the South Korean workers are temporary workers. That's about twice as, mu as many uh, as the OECD average. Organized labor uh, in South Korea is only about 10% of the entire workforce, whereas in a place like the UK, and this was uh, uh, as of 2010, in, in a place like the UK where we are, uh, the, the share of organized labor is about 27%, uh, and in Sweden, it's 68%. So uh, you have this kind of in a context within which we start to understand the implication of free trade agreement between EU and Korea, or co between Korea and other countries. And these are the kind of issues uh, we pro which, which are going to be in the background of our talks by two uh, uh, guest speakers. The first talk will be by uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Thomas uh, Jenkins, who, is, uh, who joined the International Department of the Trade Union Congress in Britain in 1973. And he has uh, <laughs> many years of experience in this area, became head of the uh, Trade Union Congress in, uh, Europe Unit in 1994 and Secretary for EU and International e Relations in 1999. And he was also seconded to the Foreign and Commonwealth Office in 1979 to 1980, where he served as Deputy International Labor Advisor. In October 2003, he joined the European Trade Union Com Com uh, Confederation as the Senior Advisor to the General Secretary. And he has represented the British and European Trade Union movements in a range of international trade union and joint bodies. Uh, which also include the European Economic and Social Committees. He is currently chair of the Dep uh, domestic advisory group set up under the EU Korea FTA and co-chair of the Joint Civil Society Forum. Uh, the second speaker, Mr. Yorgos uh, Altensis, is the Economic and Social Policy of Officer of the International Trade Union Confederation. He advocates uh, a worker's interest in international trade and investment negotiation processes advising on the use of trade instruments to promote labor rights and promoting industrial and structural transformation policy in the global uh, trade agenda. He is also a member of the EU-Korea Domestic Advisory Group. So without further ado, let us welcome Mr. Tom Jenkins. Thank you very much. Is this, is this on? Uh, okay. okay, thanks. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Dr. Sin and Shin, and uh, thank you to the, to the uh, Society for, for inviting us uh, to this, and uh, thanks to the students who have uh, sent in questions. Uh, I must say, I, I'm not exactly Jeremy Corbyn, so that uh, Prime Minister's question time saying uh, Kevin from Middlesbrough has asked me to, to put this question to you. Uh, nevertheless, perhaps the, the, the main question I, I've been asked is what, what is the, uh, the union, the European trade union, uh, union's view on the linkage between labor and, and trade? And I must say that uh, if I went through the whole history of this, uh, you know, it'd be more than my 10 minutes before I even got to 1996, but uh, perhaps uh, quickly, uh, since the war, uh, where the, the whole uh, question of governance uh, uh, emerged and the question of protectionism emerged too because uh, a lot of our people remember that the 1930s uh, had created protectionism and in a way had led to the uh, Second World War. So I think in, in, in given that background, certainly in the UK but uh, in, in other European countries too, uh, the idea of opening up trade was something that, that uh, uh, that had a lot of traction. At the same time, people wanted free trade, but also fair trade. And the question of linking labor rights to trade uh, came up uh, almost immediately when the uh, pre precursor organization to Yorgos's, the International Confederation of Free Trade Unions, was set up in uh, 48. 
they started pressing for linkages between the two. And uh, the first uh, intergovernmental um, uh, paper, I suppose, document was the Havana Charter back in the 50s. But, and that already did mention a link between uh, the, uh, the labor conditions and uh, the trading conditions. However, the, uh, that charter was never really put into effect. And uh, as uh, discussions developed, uh, we had the uh, GATT, which was mentioned this morning, General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, where really the only social uh, dimension was uh, on forced labor, that uh, uh, goods produced under forced labor should not be tradable in, 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 in the same way as, as others. Uh, so that was what we had under the GATT. Uh, then moving on, you got to uh, the uh, formation of the WTO and uh, uh, the so-called Singapore discussions. Uh, there was a massive uh, ministerial meeting in Singapore where basically the countries concerned in the WTO decided that labor standards should stay with the International Labor Organization and that trade would stay in the World Trade Organization and there wouldn't really be any linkage between the two. And uh, since then, of course, the, uh, the, the international trade, trade and trade union movement has been trying to fix uh, a kind of um, walkway, a passerelle, as we say in French, between the WTO and the ILO. Uh, without too much success, I must say, even when uh, Pascal Lamy, who uh, figures a lot in, 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 this question, in, in this discussion, because he was the chef de cabinet of Jacques Delors when Delors brought social, uh, a, a really uh, a social dimension to the EU. And in brackets, some people talk about Brexit. Uh, one of the reasons why the British trade union movement and the European trade union movement, in fact, are pro uh, uh, the EU to, to, that, to the extent that, that we do have a social dimension is that the EU, which is a trade, well, originated as a, as a trade um, area, also has a social dimension and quite a strong one. And, and, and we've, in a way, tried to uh, expand that within Europe, but also in trade deals across the world. Uh, however, as I said, the WTO hasn't been able to, to deliver this. And as was uh, mentioned by the Commission this morning, uh, by um, 2006, it was quite clear that the Doha development agenda uh, was failing. Uh, at the same time, the United States and various other countries, including Korea, were uh, negotiating a multi, uh, a huge number of, uh, of free trade agreements, and the EU decided uh, at the, in its Global Europe uh, uh, um, uh, document to uh, move in towards FTAs. I must say that um, originally a lot of these FTAs were meant to be region to region. Uh, that's the EU trying to create, recreate the world in its own uh, image, you know, that we are a region and therefore Mercosur or Latin uh, Central America or ASEAN uh, should be taken together. But that uh, th approach has uh, not been very successful, certainly not in Asia. Of course, uh, ASEAN uh, having uh, such a, a, a wide uh, diversity of members from uh, you know, Burma, Myanmar and Laos on one side to Singapore on the other uh, would have been very difficult to, uh, to, to put together. But part of the global Europe strategy was to start a negotiation with Korea, uh, one of the few individual countries at the time, uh, as together with India. Uh, TTIP, you know, the Americans, CETA, the Canadians were nowhere n near that. Uh, that's only became perhaps as an afterthought. So we had the uh, discussions, and we were, uh, as uh, European TUC, uh, involved in discussions uh, during the negotiations on the EU Korea. And uh, one of our key uh, concerns was that we wanted uh, a strong uh, labor chapter in the, uh, in the treaty. And we also remember that in 1996, when Korea had joined the OECD, they had given uh, strong and, uh, undertakings that they would uh, respect ILO standards, in particular freedom of association, free collective bargaining, uh, non-discrimination, and child labor, etc. There are eight uh, key standards. And perhaps to answer a question which uh, I've, I've, I've been put from, from, from some of you is, you know, are we trying to impose European standards on our partners? No. 
uh, the ILO standards are universal standards, they're hu in fact human rights, uh, the, the right of association is a human right, not, not uh, just a trade union right. Uh, and those are the key uh, standards that, that we want to see linked in. Uh, in the uh, negotiations, eventually, we did get a chapter, chapter 13 of the, uh, of the EU um, Korean FTA, uh, which does set down, firstly, the aspirations of both parties, and the aspirations include um, um, uh, signing and, and in fully implementing the key ILO standards. Secondly, a monitoring mechanism, uh, and that's where the uh, domestic advisory group that, that uh, you mentioned, Chair, uh, was set up, which has uh, 12 members, uh, four from the union side, four from the employer side, and four from the, uh, uh, from the NGOs. And I think that, that, that uh, Yorgos will, will tell you uh, more about that uh, as he's part, part of uh, the DAG as well. Uh, we've had uh, some problems with the Korean uh, uh, authorities, particularly over the last three years. And, and that's one of, one of the issues there, is, is that you can have all these treaties but at the end of the, the, the day, it's the political will that, that uh, uh, comes. And I think that the change in government in Korea towards a much more authoritarian uh, system has had an effect, a neg negative effect, on the implementation of Chapter 13. And by the way, it's not just the union saying that. There, there's a United Nations special rapporteur on uh, the, the rights of freedom of association, etc., who uh, produced a report just uh, a, a couple of weeks ago. So that, that's been one of the problems. The Korean uh, agreement is very important because it's creating a template for other agreements. And in a way, uh, what we're discussing now, the key issue that uh, everybody has on the back of their minds is, uh, <coughs> is TTIP with the, uh, with the Americans. And we are the le lessons that we are learning from the Korean agreement uh, are, are being fed into to those discussions. Now, just a couple of words on the next steps, uh, because uh, as you know, although, and that was mentioned this morning as well, although this Korean agreement is so-called free uh, new generation of agreements, in fact, it's been superseded already because since uh, that was agreed, we've had the Lisbon Treaty and the EU now has uh, competence in investment. And so uh, they uh, and, and the Korean side are, are, will be discussing, I suppose, uh, the introduction of in investment in a new uh, revised agreement. Investment, uh, as any of you who've been uh, following the TTIP discussion, uh, leads to a discussion on the investor state dispute settlement, ISDS, which uh, if you want to discuss, we can do later. Uh, it, uh, oh, oh, the, the new steps uh, would, would also uh, in, in, uh, introduce a discussion on Kaesong, which is a big issue for us and uh, for, for uh, in terms of labor rights, uh, and that, again, you can discuss it if, if you want to. Uh, finally, the geopolitics. Th it was hinted at this morning, but really, I think people were being very diplomatic. When you think trade, when you talk trade, think China. And all these trade deals, be it TTP, be it this one, be it any other one, is to do with how to deal with China. And, and, and I think that, uh, you know, th this... Uh, uh, this dimension cannot be uh, be overlooked uh, in, 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 in this. So I, I've, I've had a couple of uh, signs saying that uh, I'm over time, but I'm, I'm sure that if there are any questions on these points, uh, I'd be glad to, to answer them. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, without further ado, let's uh, shall we move on to Mr. Yorgos Alcintas. Yes. Thanks a lot. And Good afternoon, everyone. Um, well, since I'm addressing a mostly or largely Korean audience, let me first say that I always found uh, the trip of Korea from being a least developed country into developed country, a member of the OECD, a uh, fascinating story, um, full of lessons for other developing countries of smart use of industrial policy. And um, I haven't read this story uh, better said than uh, anyone else than Professor Ha Jung Chang of the Cambridge University. But if you have any other better suggestions, please get me after this panel. Um, another thing is that when we talk about trade, uh, mm -hmm. is a little bit like talking about God. You cannot make a statement that has universal application. Uh, so having this in mind, I'll explain a little bit how we see the effect of 
opening trade is on um, on the society and the economy, uh, mainly on, on capital and labor. So trade has um, winners and losers. And uh, depending on, on where you belong, you're going to say a different uh, story. Now, the old way of uh, saying the story had only winners. And the, only, uh, the old story is, is used today in order to convince public opinion that trade, no matter when, uh, no matter between who and who, is always uh, going to lead to um, um, beneficial results for, for everybody. So on the right side here, you can see um, the old story. Uh, it says that competition exists between sectors uh, of different countries, and some sectors will grow, and they will absorb all the labor and capital that is shared by, uh, the, the, by sectors that are shrinking. Now, on the other side, you have the new new trade theory, as it's called, and um, it's, it's speaking about competition existing between firms within and between countries, and uh, competitive firms will grow, and the uncompetitive firms will have to shrink their activity or shed labor or uh, retreat in informality or close down um, altogether. So it's a much more nuanced uh, story. What, what trade opening does, and, and to that everybody agrees, is it causes a, a reshuffling of uh, production factors like capital and labor from uncompetitive or less competitive positions to more competitive positions. So it increases productivity um, overall. Now, this is happening in, in several ways. One, one of the, and the most basic way is you have a competitive company uh, from um, giving a, a, a competitive product, cheap, uh, very functional and all that. And on the other hand, you have an uncompetitive company that cannot catch up and is driven out of the market. But two more ways of doing that is uh, mergers and acquisitions, uh, where a competitive company is taking over some other smaller companies usually. Um, and the other one is funneling, which is uh, something that is happening particularly uh, a lot in Korea, is um, when a company is very successful in one sector and then expands in other sectors. So for example, you have Hyundai, uh, which is famous for making its cars, but they also make watches, escalators, insurance services, construction services, and, and a lot of other things, shipbuilding. Uh, so these, these are mainly the ways that market power is getting consolidated. And um, trade opening indeed leads to consolidation of market power because bigger companies can make use of all these advantages and it's not an exhaustive uh, list. There's, a, there's a, a fabulous report about this called The Ascent of Giants. Uh, it's taking a lot of examples and it's um, written by, um, on a Canadian focus, but uh, indeed a lot of, uh, of the evidence in there um, can be used on, on many other countries. And right, so because of all these um, reasons behind me, I hope it's the right slide, since I brought my sunglasses because I have the um, thing against my eyes then companies um, become large, right? And uh, the bigger the company becomes, then the more power it has vis-a-vis -vis the buyers, the consumers, but also its suppliers, which are uh, downstream in the supply chain, and also vis-a-vis -vis labor and governments. And that has many, many implications, of course. So a modestly open economy, usually, right, uh, has a high chance of looking a little bit like this. You have some bigger firms, some smaller firms, but you don't have any uh, huge uh, elephants. So the income gets distributed more evenly, um, and starting up a new company is not that difficult in such an environment. Now, make an economy very, very open, run the watch for a couple of decades, and then the picture might look a little bit like this. Um, so, again, I'm saying it's um, a theological debate. It's not the case everywhere. This is the picture of Korea, obviously, United States, Australia, Canada. In Europe, the economy is more still 
based on, on small and medium enterprises being innovative. So this is not the picture, for example, of Germany or Scandinavian countries. But on the other hand, depending on the sector, uh, you come here in the UK where 76% of UK's groceries are taking place in only four major um, supermarkets. And uh, so depending on the sector, the picture might look like this uh, also in, in other countries. Um, so in this environment, smaller companies are struggling to survive and new entrants, as I said, is uh, quite difficult to get in the market except if they are exceptionally innovative and then most probably they're going to be bought uh, by some bigger company very soon. And similar is the situation vis-a-vis -vis workers. Uh, there's a constant promulgation of uh, combat competitive uh, ideals among workers. Uh, you cannot leave your office before uh, the boss leaves. Uh, you have to accept a lot of years with a low wage and prove yourself uh, in order to, to move up the scale. And still, you should be thankful for having uh, a job altogether. And, um, Taking in all, all this into account, a little bit of the, the concentration of power caused by my, uh, market opening and a little bit of the policies of the Korean government, which are particularly anti-labor to keep the wages down, to keep the unions out, um, and a little bit of the effects of other uh, globalization-linked factors, uh, you get an, an unhappy nation. And... Right. Sorry. <laughs> this is the, the, the sunglasses we need. So this is, uh, I was reading an article on, on Washington Post the other time, right, uh, with the title, Young South Koreans Call the Country Hell and Look for Ways Out. And it was talking about um, Hell jo Joseon, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, being a 19th um, century medieval kingdom um, where, where you have uh, students working extremely long hours, uh, studying extremely long hours for really a bleak employment future. And, and since there's many Koreans in the room, I'd like to, to test this. So how many of the Korean students in the room have studied, in your opinion, uh, extremely long hours? <laughs> Three, four, five, seven. Typical encouragement. The question is how many of the Koreans uh, in the room think that they have studied extremely long hours in high school? And there's more hands going up now. <laughs> right. Now, how many of you think that, that you have a bright employment future when you go back in your country, if at all? Um, so maybe it doesn't stand. But anyway, in the EU, we are, we are in the same direction, uh, where standards are being lowered and um, you know, the crisis, the internal devaluation policies and all that uh, leading us to getting rid of, of the social state, the welfare state. So that's my last slide here. It was mentioned by, uh, by Dr. Shin before, about one fourth of the labor force is working in precarious jobs and precarious jobs lead to precarious lives. People do not make decisions to marry, have children, buy a house, all these basic decisions that are making um, our lives go on, really. Now, I don't claim that all this is just because of the EU-Korea Free Trade Agreement or trade <laughs> itself, but it's uh, all this, uh, you know, uh, increased competition, market consolidation uh, that are fueling these trends of, of having an extreme inequality of 0.1% uh, wealth growing immensely and on the other hand, um, labor that has to work even longer hours for, for much, much less. So what the FDA does for that, it established a domestic advisory group, one in Korea, one in the EU, um, that I'm a member of, and Tom uh, is, the, is the chair of that. And when they come together once a year, it's called the Civil Society Forum. And, and there they discuss, they discuss, they discuss, and they make a document that they give to the governments in the end, and the governments usually don't do much about it. So in, the, in, the, in 2013, we prepared uh, an opinion on the fundamental rights uh, at the working place, uh, at work in, um, in Korea. And what we found was uh, several shortcomings in law. It can be quite specific, so I won't go through that now. Um, 
and egregious practices uh, against uh, labor in order to curb unionism. So illegal methods like raiding um, uh, buildings, confiscating computers um, uh, of, of unions and, and of opposition parties, collecting DNA of uh, protesters, suing unions uh, for millions of, um, of won uh, in order to bankrupt them, uh, excessive use of uh, police violence against unionists and demonstrators, incarceration of union leaders, like the very recent one of uh, President of the Korean Confederation of Trade Unions, Mr. Han, uh, and, um, and various other things. Uh, so, for example, the government is suggesting to companies directly to renegotiate or get rid of the collective agreements they might have, which is something that has been criticized by the ILO, um, openly promotes flexible uh, forms of contracts, and many other things. So what happened with that opinion? We presented it to the Korean side. The Korean side responded to us like they were government representatives, and in fact many of them had been before. Uh, and um, they adopted, we adopted a very much watered down text of recommendations that is actually weaker than the actual FTA um, standards. And, um, and then we wrote to, as, as a European domestic advisory group, we wrote to the Commissioner de Gucht at that moment, uh, asking him to uh, start a consultation process, which is the nuclear option but, um, offered by the FDA, but at the same time it's, it's a quite toothless uh, procedure of complaining that cannot lead to any trade sanctions. And the Commissioner said, well, it's not that bad, we prefer to talk with the Koreans, so he did nothing. And now we have a new Commissioner, so we might want to start um, a second complaint process that most probably will stop at the commissioner's door. So, um, yeah, the FDA is not doing almost anything <laughs> about promoting in a serious way uh, labor rights or environmental protection or other things. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, well, thank you very much for again uh, uh, to our two speakers in the second part of this session. Very inspiring and exciting. I, uh, well, not exciting to hear the, the labor rights issues, but uh, really uh, informative to understand the situation. I understand the, uh, the, sec the first uh, afternoon session started about 15 minutes late because of the extended lunch hour. So I want to make sure the uh, session, especially speakers who are here on Saturday, get their uh, 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 promised uh, minutes. Um, so we'll spend another five to uh, seven minutes or so in a to have the Q&A, uh, and, and hopefully we get some questions from here and there. Yes, there's uh, perhaps someone who hasn't asked a question yet. Yes, one over there in the balcony area. Uh, another one here in, in the second row. Hello, uh, Liam Campling, Queen Mary University of London. As you both sit, sit on the DAG, what do you think can be done to reform the DAG system in order to improve it? Okay, that was brief but clear. Uh, uh, second question yeah. over here in the second this is row. Oh, sorry. actually the gentleman here was... Uh, first of all, uh, you could you use the mic, please? Uh, first of all, thank you for your talk. It was very insightful. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Jeff. I'm a law student from University of Kent. And I have one specific question for Mr. Jenkins. Um, could you please elaborate on what you mean with by the dimension of China? Do you mean that China is obstructing the goals of FTAs? Or does China pose any political problems? Okay. Um, another question here. And there's probably the last question on, uh, in the balcony area. And let's, well, I think the force to start with and see how that goes. Uh, Farhan from the University of Cambridge. My question was re with regard to the implications of FTAs and trade liberalization on uh, social and economic inequality in Korea and in general, for per se. Okay, thank you for making all the questions very brief. Uh, last one, uh, please. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Dora Savi from the University of Geneva. I have two questions. One is that in view of I would say, as also the speaker said, a failed past five years with the uh, FTA. Um, going towards the TT, um, TTIP, is there any chance that 
uh, there would be a rethinking of the design of the labor chapter in that agreement in terms of pushing more for the option of um, sanctions, like it is the case in the U.S. trade agreements. And um, the other question is, um, how much do you think the failure is, um, because is is basically a result of also the fact that they grouped environment and labor under the same chapter. Thank you. Okay, I think that, uh, those are already quite a few for speakers to respond. Would you take time to respond to any of these? Okay, um, well there's one question about reforming the DAG system and a couple of others on uh, TTIP and the, uh, the architecture of the chapter. And I think maybe those, those questions go together. Uh, as I said, the, uh, the, c the Korean uh, system is, is the first one, is a template, and we've been learning. Uh, and one of the problems uh, that uh, Yorgos mentioned is that although there is a system uh, for disputes, uh, it's, uh, the, the parties can, can have consultations, they can set up uh, a, 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 an expert group to look at the complaints, the complaints, uh, there will be a report on the complaints. You can uh, agree or not agree to uh, publish that report, and then that's it. So there isn't the sanction at the end of the, of, of the process, and I think that that's one of the issues that we've raised. And as, as has been mentioned in, in the discussions on uh, TTIP, uh, we certainly, uh, in conjunction with the FLCIO, the American trade unions, have been pressing for uh, introducing some of the U.S. system, which is sanctions. However, there are problems with that too, in that their sanctions only uh, apply to trade-related issues. Now, if you're talking about freedom of association, uh, and uh, the Korean government uh, bans the teachers' union, for example, which they have, um, it's rather difficult to, s to link that to a trade-related issue. Uh, although the FLCIO ha have uh, some, uh, some, some ways of, of, of explaining this. So we do want to, to introduce sanctions, but in a, in, in, <coughs> in a different way. On the question of linking uh, labor and environment, we have had discussions on that. Uh, on the whole, up to now, we thought, felt that there are synergies between the two which, which are helpful. Uh, however, it might well be that in TTIP, because the Americans don't have these sustainable development chapters which have labor and environment under one hat, we would just have a labor chapter, which would help in certain other ways, uh, coming back to uh, the reform of the, the, the uh, system, <coughs> which would be that we would have more of an independent secretariat rather than relying on DG Trade to put in the, uh, the complaints or to accept the complaints. So that there are uh, parts like that. Uh, I'm sure you has got more to add. Uh, on on, <coughs> sorry. on uh, China, uh, well, cer certainly, you know, wh what I was saying I I is that in the back of the thinking of all our negotiators, be it CPP or, um, or, or, or TTIP or um, whatever, uh, the, the question of, of, of uh, China playing a major part in trades is, is, is always there. One of the big issues, in fact, is rules of uh, origin. Now, talking to our American colleagues, they are up in arms in particular because the rules of origin are less than 50%, which means that lots of goods which will become TPP goods will, in fact, have originated from China. And, uh, and uh, that was one of the issues which uh, the motor manufacturers in, in, in uh, EU were really worried about uh, when the Korean deal was being uh, reached. In fact, up to now, I don't think that, that you've had to have uh, and, and any, well, we, we haven't had to, to have a, a, any procedures to, 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 to deal with that. Uh, but, that, you know, uh, any trade deal mu mu must take uh, China into, into account. But, uh, Yorgos, I'm sure you've got more to say. So, um, what we have done to improve the DAGs, well, when we went to Korea for the second time, I mean, the first time out, it was not me, it was... Um, James Howard from, uh, from our side was we show the Korean DAG except a couple of uh, seats of labor and a couple of seats of employers. The rest were professors and, and that's how Koreans understand what is civil society. And, and that's not because simply civil society is interest groups. So it's political discussion. I mean, experts and, and uh, professors, etc. are perfect, but 
they are speaking for themselves. Uh, they are not speaking representing a group whose interest might be in, certain co in, in direct conflict, actually, with uh, the interests of, of other groups. So there has been a reform of the membership of the Korean DAG because we raised that issue and the Commission also helped us a lot. So some members have been reformed and now we have a little bit more labor representatives and more uh, employers representatives. Still some professors stay on and many of these members of the members of the Korean DAG reply like they were um, go government uh, officials. And then uh, we also the rules are written here and there, but they do not foresee every little case. So there's a lot of space for, uh, I don't know if I would call it institutional creativity. So, for example, I, I like playing the bad cop there, and uh, some other colleagues are playing the good cop, so then we get good compromises. One of the things was to insist that the final recommendations should be discussed openly between the two DAGs instead of only between the, the, the two co-chairs, for example. And that uh, has led to, in my opinion, some, uh, some changes. And um, the implications uh, of the EU-Korea FTA on, on labor and inequality and all that, well, I thought I was just presenting on that matter. Of course, we can talk for hours here. But really, the, there are two very good reports. One is the, uh, uh, the Ascent of Giants, as I said. Another one is From Myths to Facts, written by the ILO and the EU. And there's a lot of concentrated knowledge um, and, and liter uh, literature reviews uh, where, where you can find more information. On TTIP, uh, rethinking of the labor chapter. Yeah, we know that the, in the U.S. approach on, on labor, in FTAs, um, they do not make, they do not take a lot of commitments. So instead of referring directly to the ILO conventions, they're referring to the declaration that established that these eight ILO conventions are what we call the core labor standards, which might lead to weak results from a legal point of view. But on the other hand, they have a mechanism that can lead to trade sanctions in the end of the road if one country. Uh, lacks the political will to improve, I mean, to, to abide and uphold the, the international labor standards. Um, the EU has the approach that it doesn't go to sanctions, but they take all the commitments. So if we can marry the best elements of these two, maybe we get some labor chapter um, that, you know, can do actually something for workers. Now, putting labor and environment in the same bag, in my opinion, is a mistake. They should have uh, different bugs, and what is my most important is that even when we had good, let's put it like that way, good labor chapters with uh, sanctions in the end, um, well, they have been used only once. It's the uh, case of uh, U.S. against Guatemala, and it has been dragging its feet eight years now with no results. So it's something quite political, and we need to depoliticize uh, these these type of mechanisms in order to work. So. It would be a perfect system where you have a case coming in the ILO, Committee on Freedom of Association, against one country, and then some free trade agreements would actually enable automatic sanctions against that country, because if the case reached the Commission um, uh, for, for the Freedom of Association of the ILO, it means that, uh, you know, it has been on the, um, on the table for quite many years, and the government has done nothing to address it. So if we could connect ILO existing instruments with trade instruments and we take the government decision to trigger or not a case, so we depoliticize uh, these type of mechanisms, maybe we will have much better results. Okay, right, thank you. Uh, I believe the, uh, the time is up, but do, uh, before I uh, conclude the session, please do remain seated because we are not starting the refreshment session, but we are having a case study session on uh, uh, given by Korea Creative Content Agency. So this is a short case study to listen to before having refreshment uh, sessions. So please do remain seated. Can I welcome uh, everyone to thank all our four speakers who provide really interesting talks today. Thank you so much. It was really, really good.